Hey everybody, thank you for joining us. It's another edition of Never Go Against the Family, our UNI Family Business Center podcast. I'm joined by a couple of folks from RSM. Uh, with me today is Andy Swanson and Maxwell Youngquist. Um, a couple of uh, folks in their family office uh, space do a lot of work with family-owned businesses, um, both from a tax standpoint and, I, and as I, I'm sure they'll uh, let us know uh, with other things as well when it comes to family office management um, and other issues uh, for multi-generational family companies. And so they're going to be speakers for us at our conference in a couple of weeks, and we wanted to preview their session a little bit. Uh, today to give you a better sense of what they'll be talking about on November 2nd. Um, and so I know that you, I, a focus of your of your presentation is going to be on, on thinking about your business, um, thinking about uh, the possibility of sale. Um, I know that's a, I used to work in the investment banking world and I, you know, now see the other side of it is, is um, private equity is all over the place, constantly knocking on the door of these family-owned companies. Um, and, and beyond that, there's so much uh, dry capital or whatever they call it out there, uh, looking looking for deals, looking for yield, looking for return, and family and companies are certainly in that deal house. And so I know that our members are getting hit up, if you will, for, uh, you know, what would it take? What's the number? What do they need to sell? That kind of a thing. And so I think if we're, we wouldn't do justice to serving our families if we didn't cover this kind of a topic and talk about it. What does sell really look like? How do we think through that before we actually get to it? And so, um, Andy, you mentioned one thing I thought it was kind of cool here was we were just starting. You talked about, you know, beginning with the end in mind and thinking about your business from that standpoint. And the end is, is you know, is, is a myriad of options. It's selling to, to the outside world or it's, you know, giving or selling to the next generation of your family as well. But if we focus on that selling to the outside world more so, you know, I don't know if you want to, what are your thoughts when you, when you mention that phrase or when you hear that phrase of beginning with the end in mind? Yeah. You know, Dan, it's a, it's a really good question. You, you hear beginning with the end in mind a lot in the startup world, right? Where mm -hmm. uh, you kind of organize yourself in order to uh, eventually sell the business or do whatever it is that you want to do with, with it. Um, but I think it also applies to, you know, growth phase businesses, businesses that are within the family and plan on staying within the family. And, you know, the reason I think it's important is you think about those last three years before a sale, oftentimes you're focused on valuation. How do I drive the, the highest valuation I possibly can for that sale? that I'm going to be exposed to uh, kind of post-sale. So I'm making decisions a little bit differently. Well, it just so happens those same decisions can kind of apply a lot earlier. So you think about growing your business, that's what that's one of those things that's going to lead to a better valuation, uh, finding new uses for old uh, old products, finding new ways to market products, things of that nature. All of those things, if I come up with them 10 years before a sale, they're just as valuable, if not more valuable than if I come with, up with them three years before a sale. Um, and that's why we kind of kind of one of the reasons we say, um, you know, let's let's run our business like we're getting ready to sell our business. I think the other reason is we've all heard stories uh, happens more often than we'd like to like to admit of businesses that weren't planning on selling until somebody knocked on their door and said, hey, you know, I've got this offer you can't refuse. Well, the bad thing is, by the time you get that offer, you can't refuse. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do in order to plan for the sale. Um, but if you've done this, if you've run your business, like you're getting ready to sell your business, then it doesn't matter because you've always run your business. Like you're getting ready for that day that that offer comes in. That's so, just kind of a good practice in general, right? And I mean, if you're running your business like you're going to sell it, you're probably running it in a way to continue to reap the most rewards out of it as well, too. And then what? You know, then exactly. that's uh, hit by the bus type of scenario too, where you're not planning for it in a family business that can manifest itself in a lot of different ways from, you know, liquidity needs of the next, of, of the current generation or a branch of the tree that goes a wall or something on you or whatever it might be that, that could force your hand in those ways too, right? Yep. Okay. I like that. I like that. I appreciate it. Um, so if we think about, 
you know, running our business with that end in mind. You know, you talk about some of the different growth drivers out there to, to be focusing on. And I don't want this, this podcast isn't about, you know, business management or, you know, growth, that kind of thing. I think, I think you can figure out what those drivers are on your own. But um, what about if we think about kind of as we're then running our business and uh, Max, I think you said this, you know, at, at some point you start to look, look and feel like you've got one foot in the business and one foot out of the business, maybe a little bit. And, and how does that, how do you do that? Well, I guess, how do you, um, how do you manage that? Um, knowing that, you know, we're running this thing at, um, potentially for the next generation and trying to be good stewards of it. But at the same time, what if we get, you know, and there are offers out there, I'm sure right now, maybe not as much as there were six months ago, with the rate environment and discounts and things like that going on the way they are. But still, what if we get that offer that, you know, holy cow, how can we turn this down type of thing? What, how, do you see owners that are in that situation or how do you keep from going nuts in that situation? You know, Andy, Andy kind of said it too. Part of this getting your business ready for sale or the end in mind is you're starting to also mentally prepare the family and the family members that you're doing this process, you're setting up this roadmap. And so early on, you're communicating with them of, you know, we may get an offer and we may sell. So we're going to, you know, you're going to start doing that kind of family negotiation beforehand of what that looks like, what would be their goal if we did sell, would they want to exit or are they going to move on or, or would they actually like to stay in the business, even if it does sell and, and still be an employee? So I think working out those processes before you actually get that that fax in the door, as Andy said, with an offer for, for X amount of millions of dollars that you've had, you've started to have those conversations. People are mentally preparing that their lives may have what is actually a, a kind of big shift for them sure. in their environment in, in the everyday. And so when it comes up, it's not going to be a fight because every everyone loves surprises until they get one like this, where that is kind of an emotional <laughs> gut surprise where you're not going to have the best emotional responses to it. If it's an immediate thing where it's like, I can't even take time to think about this. I only have 60 days or 90 days or it's already started. And you feel kind of those walls coming in a little bit on the decision itself. And it's a very emotional one. It's a very family one too, because if they have a roadmap for, getting to the sale and even after the sale, it's going to be easier to get through this when there is a roadmap for it. This is what your life's going to look like. This is going to be the family after the sale. It's we've thought about this, you know, the, the proper planning goes a long way for those conversations. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's great. I mean, thinking about the fact that selling doesn't mean that you, that you're losing your job potentially. Even, right? you know? But that's going to be their first response. If you haven't talked about it. Oh, I'm out. Oh, we're done. We're, <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, we were we were actually talking earlier today, Dan, um, and, uh, you know, nine times out of 10, it doesn't mean you lose your job because yeah. the guy, that, the, the the team that's buying you likely needs you, at least for integration for a period of time and oftentimes to manage the company into the future, depending upon what the buyer looks like. So. Well, great point. You know, yeah. So you may be you just uh changing who, what's uh, written on your W-2 or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. And so then another couple of con points I know that you're going to expand on at the conference are, are going to be things about post-sale. So now we've sold the business and what do we look, what do we look like? Are we still a, a business family? Are we still um, keeping our assets tied together? Are we doing some sort of family office? Um, are we what things the business might have been doing for us on the family side a little bit. Uh, where are we going for those services now? Uh, are our branches going their separate ways? Are we looking to get into different types of opportunities? You know, how do you coach families uh, to think about that? Because that's obviously a real thing too. I mean, there's obviously the tax implications part of it and, the, you know, what that lump sum looks like, but then there's the, what do we do with that lump sum? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that too? Yeah, what we want to talk about is, you know, you have a kind of a formal family business governance framework in place, and now it's gone, you know, potentially you've sold the entire thing, you've exited it. So setting up a family governance framework to operate after the business isn't in existence to make family decisions. Now, if everyone's just going to go their separate way, 
you know, they're going to have their own team of advisors that we try to have them set up again, because you've had a windfall of money and you may be great managing your own business. That doesn't mean that you don't need outside advisors and an outside team to now manage your wealth. Um, it's not often that you're going to find everyone that can do everything. So you're going to need that evolving set of advisors, whether they stay together or don't. Um, if they do stay together, again, you need that informal family governance framework to keep decisions moving so you don't hit paralysis. And we've seen this a couple of times where they don't have anything in place. Everyone's sold. And now nobody kind of knows the chain of command anymore or how they're going to work or how they're even going to make decisions together. There's been nothing in yeah. place. Um, and then kind of the last one is, if the family business was a big source of family unity, what's going to bring us together now? And that's sometimes where you do get into a family office is going to bring us together. Sometimes it's you don't need that. Or sometimes there's elements of a family office that are going to provide that unifying thing. And kind of lastly, as you hinted on, is the family business is probably doing a, a wide variety of services from the family, from administrative to cash management, maybe even doing that financial planning that we're now going to outsource, that kind of financial mm -hmm. management. So having something in place and this, is, this even goes back again, like once you hear of the transaction or even before, making sure you have that process and roadmap in place because you oftentimes don't want that big gap. And that can be very frustrating when just nothing, you know, we lost the administrative system. We lost the person that was doing our cash management. You need to have that in place. So when you do have that windfall of money, that apparatus is in there to start helping you through that to, so that time isn't wasted where it's just sitting in checking accounts or the entities aren't structured or waiting for for the legal team to set it up or we don't know we don't have that advisor there's a complete gap in kind of our skill set that we need as a family to accomplish what we want and, and overall too it's always good to have these conversations especially like 36 or not 30, 36 months in advance um because a lot of people tend to not even make that decision about what they're going to do if it is involving retirement when the business is sold or, or a complete kind of change in trajectory in their lives yeah. to kind of have an idea so that you're working towards that too. So it's not like the shut off of a lever of, okay, we close that one. Now we're going to open another because it's going to be more successful. I think for these life transitions as they go through, some people take up a new hobby. Some people st even start a new business right. and it's much easier to drive into those when a little bit of that pre-work and framework is put, put in place. So you're not going through kind of those as a family, emotional ups and downs or kind of, you know, you have that it's, it's comforting to know that all of that just didn't go away. And now there's this period of nothing. And then I got to figure this all out. And so yeah. having those kind of pre-prepared a little bit with, I know what I'm going to do. Even if you end up changing it afterwards, having at least that kind of roadmap and a plan and, and, and the, the bricks in place, the mortar so that you can, you can do that. Because again, you also don't want to be sitting on wealth and you miss investment opportunities or you miss a big bull run in the market. It, it's going to have that real feel bad moment when it's like, hmm. well, we miss it as a family because we didn't Oops. plan. We didn't have yeah. advisors in place. And, and those take more time than people think um, to kind of change banking relationships, change advisor relationships. Because again, that, that advisor set of advisors you have is going to evolve. It's going to involve a different set of lawyers. It's going to involve a different set of probably wealth planners. It's going to mm -hmm. involve a different set of tax expertise. You know, that's another big one too. You, you had this entire tax industry expertise and now you're going to have to onboard and get, get associated with the people that are going to handle some of these other issues. And again, the earlier you do it and the more you have in place and know who to call, it's going to be a lot easier for the family to make that transition. And and the family can make that transition, right? Yeah, it is. And so some of this is really easy of, of getting in touch, just interviewing some advisors and knowing mm -hmm. that, okay, when we sell, I approach, I give this person a call. We, we file this document. We do this. We meet as a family. We know the structure. We know the cadence. Um, but the, that goes a long way, um, especially when it can be kind of running, anxiety can be kind of running high. Yeah. Big life transition. Yeah. If you wait until the moment of, I'm sure then you're not, you're making more emotional decisions and, and a, a yeah. family can use that wealth uh, created by the sale to stay. Together. Yeah. In, in mobilizing it quickly is important too. The other thing is the rest of your life doesn't stop during this too. You know what I mean? Like you, there's also those other things happening in your life that you're also trying to manage and, and we, we have this kind of phenomenon where they get so focused on this, they forget they're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is now becomes a little bit chaotic for me because the rest of my life hasn't changed. You know, there's still babies being born. There's still all the kids going to college. There's still 
you know, all mm-hmm. this other stuff mm-hmm. happening in their lives. They're buying a vacation home. They're, you know, doing this. They're they're moving houses. You mm-hmm. know, it, all that other stuff is happening too. So it can be very overwhelming too during this process if there isn't a roadmap in place and a plan. And and just as we wrap up here, there. The importance of the planning, partly in my mind, is because usually a lot of times these term sheets or these offer sheets, I guess they'd be called, come with a deadline on them, right? So you don't have six months to just sit there and think about it and have two or three quarterly family meetings to try to get your family warmed yeah. up to a point of being interested yeah. in the sale, right? I think I think part of it's because everything comes with a deadline, right? Yeah. The other component of it is, uh, you know, as you probably know, Dan, time is the enemy of a transaction. Um, the longer it takes to get from that that first deal sheet to a definitive agreement, the more likely it is that any deal is going to fall apart or that the purchase price is going to start dropping. So that's part of the reason this is so important. I could I could definitely see that. And a lot of times, if you're the reason for the time delays, you're losing power in the negotiation as well. Then too. And you're looking disorganized. You're looking like, hey, I really I really don't know what's going on. That creates risk for the buyer. Yeah. And yeah. creating risk for the buyer creates a decrease in purchase price. Sure. All that so, situation. so it uh, you know the quicker you can move, the more you look put together. And the less likely you are to see those decreases and see the deal fall apart. Okay. Also, once you get the evaluation, you know what the potential price is, and you're having that conversation in the family of knowing what they want the price to be. So Mm -hmm. making those two numbers (laughs) agree, you don't, you don't, six months isn't going to be enough time usually to do that. (laughs) And then you can save a lot of everybody's time on both sides if you know that deals coming your way just aren't anywhere close to where you want to be. Exactly. You know what to entertain and what the maybe the ones that are coming in are maybe it's your family who has outsized expectations and you can have those kinds of conversations as well than as opposed to right? exactly yeah if, if they're saying we, we think it's worth x y and z and your valuation's way under there it, maybe it's bringing some people's you know bringing them their expectations back to reality a little bit okay okay well i appreciate it as I, as I said when we started i know that private equity is incredibly active there's there's a ton of it out there they're looking for deals i i don't know if you guys can speak firsthand to that is that still the case is that still pretty true yeah yeah i i'd say it uh there aren't as many deals today as there were 6 or 12 months ago but you know transactions are still happening uh and uh it'll probably pick up in the not too distant future would be my guess Okay, yeah. Yeah, so they're going to be constantly shaking the tree and, and checking in on, on firms. And, um, so being being prepared, like I, I somebody told me once, your body won't go where your mind hasn't taken it. That's kind of what we're talking about here today. Yep. How do we how do we think through where we could end up being and, and what do we look like on the other side of that and how does that affect our family, our family dynamics and our wealth? Um, Really excited about having you guys with us at the conference. Again, it's November 2nd um, in Ames. Our host is Ag Leader Technologies. So for our members or others listening and uh, that want to come, please come to UNI Family Business Center.com. You can sign up there. Um, Maxwell, Andy, thank you so much for being with me today. And uh, we appreciate your support. And we'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Never Go Against the Family, a podcast produced by the University of Northern Iowa Family Business Center. You can find more information about the center, membership, and upcoming events at unifamilybusinesscenter.com. As Vito Corleone advises, never go against the family.